This is the first of several videos for Chapter 9, the Laplace Transform. We can start by asking the question, why do we need the Laplace Transform? After all, in Chapter 4, we learned about the Fourier Transform, which took a function of time, x of t, and converted it into a function of frequency, x of omega. Now the Fourier transform is a very powerful and useful tool, but it has its limitations. For example, it's limited to just stable signals and systems. So the Laplace transform is a generalization of the Fourier transform and extends its reach. For example, Laplace transform methods may be used for both stable and unstable signals and systems. Also, we'll see later on in this chapter, that the Laplace transform can be used for systems not initially at rest, in other words, non-zero initial conditions. Here is the definition of the Laplace transform. It takes a function of time, for example, x of t, and it converts it into a function of the variable s. Note that this integral here, which defines the Laplace transform is the exact same integral as the Fourier transform integral. But instead of j omega, we now have the variable s up here in the exponent. Now, what is s? Well, s is a complex number. It has a real part, sigma, and it also has a complex part, j omega, which is the same as the Fourier transform. So S can be plotted in the complex S plane. The S plane has the real part of S as the horizontal axis, that's sigma. The vertical axis of the S plane is the imaginary part of S, which is where omega shows up. So a particular value of S, for example, this one plotted right here, is seen as a vector in this complex S plane. We see that in the Laplace transform integral, S appears in the exponent of this function here, e to the minus st. Now, e to the st, we can think of that if we break up S as sigma and j omega, the part e to the j omega t, this part over here, is just an oscillating function as shown using Euler's formula. The other part, the real part of S, the sigma, uh, shows up as e to the sigma t, which can either be an increasing exponential with time or a decreasing exponential with time. Now, Laplace transforms are more difficult to plot than Fourier transforms. The reason for this is that they are a function of s. And remember, s has two dimensions. It has the real dimension here, or the real part, sigma, and it has the complex part, the j omega axis. So the S-plane takes up two dimensions, and then if we want to plot, for example, the magnitude of a Laplace transform, the magnitude of X of S, that would require a third dimension. So we'll talk about this uh, plotting more as we get into this lecture a little farther. Let's start with an important example, the Laplace transform of a real exponential function. Now, exponential functions are important because they are the solutions to linear differential equations, which describe many LTI systems. The good news is that we'll only have to solve this integral once. After that, we can use the results and perform Laplace transforms of exponential functions by simple inspection, which we'll see later. Okay, so the function that we wanna take a Laplace transform of is the exponential function x of t is equal to e to the minus at times the step function u of t. And we're going to limit our case here where a is a real number. Now, a can be either greater than or less than zero. Because of the minus sign in front of a, if a is greater than zero, then x of t is a decaying exponential with time, like the red line here. And the other case is if a is less than zero, then uh, x of t is an increasing 
exponential function with time. Well, Laplace transform will work with either of these cases. So what we do is we take x of t and we substitute it into our definition of the Laplace transform, which is this integral here. Um, and remember that s is equal to sigma plus j omega. I'm actually going to make this substitution now because we're going to need to use this later on when we find the region of convergence of this integral. All right, so what you can see here on this line here is I've taken x of t, this function up here, and substituted it into the integral here. And I've also replaced s with sigma plus j omega. Now notice the step function, u of t, allows us to change the limits of integration from negative infinity to infinity to zero to infinity, because of course the step function only exists for positive values of t. So the next step we can do here is I can combine the exponents in these two exponential functions by simply adding them together. I've done that here, and notice I also factored out the t outside of the square brackets. This integral now, it still looks a little messy, but it's actually quite trivial. This is just a simple exponential function that we can integrate very easily. Remember the way to integrate an exponential function is whatever is up here in the exponent in front of the t comes out to the front in the denominator. So I have, remember the minus sign, I have negative one over a plus sigma plus j omega times the exponential function and we're going to evaluate this from zero to infinity. Now, let's look at these terms a little more carefully. The stuff out in front here is, uh, has no t in it. So in other words, it's a constant. There's no time uh, dependence at all. What I've done here is I've taken our exponential function and I've separated it into the real exponential function, e to the minus a plus sigma t, and multiply that by the complex exponential, e to the minus j omega t. So let's see how these functions behave as we try to evaluate this integral. Well, this, let's start with this part here. This is a complex exponential function. All it's doing is oscillating with a magnitude of one. So it's basically well behaved. Even as t goes to infinity, this part of the function just oscillates back and forth and it doesn't grow or get any larger. This is the key part to determine whether or not we can actually allow this integral to be performed and converge. This is a real exponential function, and it determines the convergence of the integral. Notice because of the minus sign there, remember we're evaluating this integral at t equals infinity. So when t is equal to infinity, this term here will go to zero. In other words, it will be well behaved only if a plus sigma is greater than zero. So this defines what is called our region of convergence or ROC of this transform. This, is, this integral is only going to be well behaved and exist if sigma is greater than negative a. Okay, so assuming that's the case, if, if uh, sigma is greater than negative a, or if a plus sigma is greater than zero, then this is our Fourier transform x of s of the signal up here, x of t. Now, uh, we can finally uh, evaluate this when we plug in infinity for time. Remember that this first term here is gonna go to zero, so that's the zero there. And uh, when we plug in zero, all right, we're gonna get e to the zero, all right, which of course is one. So we end up with zero minus one, which is negative one. That cancels the minus sign up here. Also notice what I've done here is I have sigma plus j omega down here in the denominator. Well, sigma plus j omega, remember that's just s from up here. So I'm gonna put my s back in my uh, transform result here. And when the dust finally settles here, you can see this thing simplifies down to something uh, very simple. The Fourier transform, x of s, is just equal to 1 over s plus a. And the region of convergence is sigma has to be greater than minus a. Now the next thing we're going to be concerned with is how to make a plot or a graph of results like this. 
To do this, we use something called a pole zero region of convergence plot or a pole zero ROC plot. Um, so what is a pole? A pole is a value of S where the Laplace transform blows up or goes to infinity. Likewise, a zero is a value of S where the Laplace transform goes to zero. The ROC or region of convergence is the values or the region of values where of S where X of S, the Laplace transform converges or in other words is well behaved. The bad news of all this is that this, uh, as we mentioned before, this requires a three-dimensional plot. This is an example of a uh, Laplace transform uh, down here. And it's, that's very difficult to plot. Usually you use a computer or something like that to plot it. Um, one thing I'll, I'll point out in here is notice this plot has two poles here where the function is blowing up to infinity. And this plot is also showing a zero over here where um, this surface, this like topographical surface of the Laplace transform is actually going to zero. All right, so the bad news is, you know, this plot is very complicated to uh, generate. The good news is we don't have to do this. We can actually get all the information we need from this plot by constructing a simple two-dimensional whole zero region of convergence plot like the one shown here. And I'm gonna show you an example of how to do this, but basically we use the symbol um, X for a pole, the symbol um, zero or O uh, to plot zeros, and we will be shading in the region of convergence um, using you know, a gray color or something like this, or you can use your pencil and just uh, cross hatch it to shade it in. All right, so let's take a look at an example. Now, this is a different example. This is not the example that we just did, but this one is um, a little better because it's gonna show us some of the different features. Let's suppose that we have a Laplace transform that we somehow calculated, and it's given by this function here, s squared plus one over s squared plus s minus six, and we're also told the region of convergence is s uh, greater, actually that should be sigma, greater than two. So our goal is let's make a pole zero region of convergence plot for this transform. All right, so to do this, the first step is we're gonna factor the transform. So um, the denominator is um, much simpler. You can see just by um, sort of trial and error, you can see that S squared plus S minus six factors into S plus three times S minus two. Um, the numerator is a little different. Um, it actually, factors uh, using S plus J and S minus J. All right, so the next step is let's find the zeros. So we find the zeros by setting the numerator to zero, right? Because that's where this Laplace transform is gonna to go to zero. So by setting the numerator to zero, we get this condition here, S plus J times S minus J equals zero. And we can easily solve this. Um, the first term here, we see when S is minus J, and for this term, we get a zero when S is equal to plus J. So we have two zeros for this transform, S equals plus or minus J. The next step, step three, we can similarly find the poles by setting the denominator to zero. So the denominator of our transform is S plus three times S minus two equals zero. Those give us the two poles minus three, S equals minus three for this first term, and S equals plus two for the second term. Now that we've got our poles and zeros, we can finally plot these in the S plane. So here we see our S plane here. Remember, this is sigma, the real axis, and this is J omega, the imaginary axis. So our two zeros, um, those are signified by the zero shape or the, the O shape symbol there. Um, they are at plus and minus one J. So that would be these two positions right there. Uh, likewise, we can plot the two poles, um, S equals minus three, that's the pole right here, and S equals plus two, that's the pole over here. The last step is remember our region of convergence is for, um, this should say sigma greater than two, sorry for the error there, and that's going to be this shaded region to the right of sigma equals two. So here is our pole zero ROC plot for this particular Fourier transform here. Now, let's go back to our exponential function example that we worked on a couple slides ago. 
we came up with this, uh, what is called a, a, a Laplace transform pair. This is the um, exponential function we started with here in the time domain. And we did the uh, Laplace transform to get this, um, this Laplace transform X of S over here, uh, which is in the frequency domain. Um, and remember that our result was uh, one over S plus A with a region of convergence of sigma greater than minus A. So the pole is found by setting the denominator to zero. So we have S plus A equals zero. Um, we can easily solve for S. S is going to be equal to minus A. So that's where the pole of this Laplace transform is. And there are no zeros in this case. So with that result, we can think of trying to plot this result in three dimensions. This would be a plot, a computer generated plot of the magnitude of the Laplace transform X of S as a function of S, which remember, you know, has two axes down here in the S plane. And um, what you can see here is that this, you know, has a pole when sigma is equal to minus A. So that pole is over here and you can see the function blows up to infinity at the pole. All right, but again, we're not gonna use uh, this three-dimensional plot because it's just difficult to draw and difficult to interpret. Instead, we can just uh, simply show a pole zero ROC plot in two dimensions like this. We have the S plane again here. We have our pole over here. The X um, denotes a pole located at sigma equals minus A. And um, we have this region greater than minus A is all shaded. That's our region of convergence. Okay, so now let's let's do an example that actually has some numbers in it uh, for our exponential function. Um, in this example, we're going to find the Laplace transform and construct a pole zero ROC plot for the exponential signal x of t equals two times e to the minus five t times u of t. So instead of having to go through uh, working out the integral and everything, we're just simply going to use our previous result of the Laplace transform pair for the exponential function, which is repeated here again in the box here. So all we have to do is by inspection, compare this function here, e to the minus at times ut, with this function here, and we can see by inspection, a is equal to five. Uh, the two out in front is just a multiplying coefficient. So we can put that two out in front of our transform here, or it's, uh, as is more likely to be done, we'll just put the two up on the top here. So we get X of S is equal to two over S plus five by inspection. And our region of convergence, remember sigma is greater than minus A. So in this case, sigma is going to be greater than minus five. Um, by looking at this, we can see that we have a pole when S is equal to minus five, a, a real pole at uh, S equals minus five. Um, and now we can plot the um, pole zero region of convergence plot. Uh, here's our pole with the X uh, shown at position of minus five. And our region of convergence is everything shaded to the right of, uh, of this pole. 